Amen. Okay, we're going to continue our series in Ephesians. And uh, we get into the practical stages now of the book. We learned all the things that Jesus has done for us. And we are thoroughly blessed. Amen? Amen. Are you blessed? Yes. Do you understand the blessings? Yes. You know what Jesus has done for you? Yes. Hallelujah. Well, now we ought to live our lives out yes. understanding that. Okay, so we're in chapter 4. And uh, last week we looked at the fact is that the church should go to, to bring up to a level of maturity. Okay, as a congregation, as a part of the body of Christ, we have to lift our level of maturity as a Christian. And today is talking about our personal Christian life. Are you growing as a Christian? The, the, the heading of, of this passage of scripture on my Bible says instructions for Christian living. Okay? It's fairly straightforward. We can... I just want to encourage... I don't know how, how many people here read the word every day. You read the, a bit of the word every day? Yes. It's, 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 it's actually critical for Christians to be able to read the word because that way we understand what God's way is, we understand what his values are, and we get to learn a little bit of what our expectations are. Okay, so often we hear people preaching that I'm saved by grace and by grace alone. Okay, and that's my ticket to heaven. Hallelujah. Well, that's part of the truth. It's not the whole truth. Okay. We can, it, it's true that our salvation we receive by grace. Okay? But just because we receive that by grace doesn't mean that that's where it finishes. Okay? There is an expectation on our life that we grow as a Christian and that you are not the same person that you were two or three years ago. That you have grown in Christ. Okay? That you, uh, are, uh, you handle yourself differently. In fact, this passage of scripture talks about uh, putting the old self off and putting a new self on. So therefore, we, need, or we ought to look different than we did before. Okay, if we remain the same, then what's the value? What's the purpose? What's, what, what is the benefit in our life if we're the same when we first got saved to the time we are now? Okay, this is what it's talking about. I'm going to look at it in four bite-sized pieces. All right, so I'll read, I'll read four portions. I'll look at the first portion, and it's um, from verse 17 through to verse 19. It says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. In talking about the Gentiles here, you ought not to be living the same as you did the day before you got saved. Okay? There ought to be a different value standard system in your life today than there was before you were a Christian. Okay? It says, In the futility of their thinking, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality as so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. Okay, before a person becomes a Christian, doesn't matter where they are, they are on the throne of their life. The most important person is number one. The most important person in a person's life, generally speaking, not us, not, not Christians, but non-Christians is themselves. And we li they live for themselves, okay, to satisfy their needs. Now, I guarantee that there will be a vast different standard of Christians, of uh, people, before they were saved here today. Some people would have lived their life pretty good. And some people out there, they live their life pretty good. And others live their life very bad. Okay, so there's a broad spectrum of that. 
But we ought to look at it, and, and the, the, the emphasis here, when it's talking about the Gentiles, it's talking about the unbelievers. It's talking for those, in some version, of course, the heathen. But it's talking about those in their life before Christ. But he says, now you, goes on a little bit later, are different to that now. Okay, so we're looking at that. So therefore, when a person is not a Christian, they are the centre of attraction. When we are Christians, Jesus is the centre of attraction. Amen? Amen? Jesus is Lord of our life, and therefore we live our lives to please him. Okay? So we're not just saved to go to heaven. We're saved for a purpose. Okay? There's, there's a reason that you've become a Christian, and that is, and that is to be a to be a role model for Jesus, to be a witness for others, so that we, in our lives, in, our, in the way we conduct our life, can reflect Jesus Christ. Okay, so we ought to be different. Now, I don't want to go too much into our background, but we would have varying backgrounds. Some would have been worse than others. The difference before we were Christians. The other thing is we need to be lifting up a level, I said before, we need to be, we're all a work in progress, right? And the other thing is we ought not to judge our lifestyle by those who aren't Christians because if we do that we say, well, I'm not as bad as they are because I don't do this and I don't do that and I do do this and, and, and so on. But that's a really bad way to, to judge our, our value and our standard in Christ. Because if we judge it by the heathen, then, then for some of us or for some of you, you look okay. But we should measure it up against the word of God. Hallelujah. That's why I said before, it's really important that we are people of the word, that we, not that you read, you don't have to read large portions of the word every day, but at least you should be reading some portions of the, of the word, so that way you can begin to know how should my life be. Today's message is fairly self-explanatory, and so therefore you can read this and you could have a look and say, well, this is how I should be doing things, okay? And so therefore... Uh, I'll pick up on a few bits. Okay, the next section says, from verse 20, it says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned. That's a reflection on me now. How much have you learned? How long have you been here and how much have you learned? Am I sharing the gospel properly? Are you being transformed by the word that's been preached? Are we sharing the whole gospel? So there's a responsibility on our part as leaders to make sure that we give uh, a balanced, proper uh, teaching of the word of God. But it says, so it is, when you heard about Christ and you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to the former ways of life to put off the old self. He says, put off the old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and be made you in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay? So God wants us to lift our level. Lift the mark. And so really, as we're going on in Christ, we should be lifting the level. We should be uh, becoming more like Christ more Christ-like. We will never measure up to Christ, okay? And no one expects that, and God doesn't even expect us to measure up to Christ, but, it, but, it, but it, the Bible does say that we're going on to perfection, okay? We're changing little by little, bit by bit, to become more like Christ. In reality, some people will never see Jesus in anybody except through you. Did you know that? Some people will not see Christ except when they see you. Okay, because of the way you conduct yourself and the way you treat people has a big bearing on others. Jesus said that, uh, that, that, that this early disciple had to wait 
for the Holy Spirit to come upon them so that they could become witnesses of Christ. So that they can be an example of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, God doesn't ask anything from anybody that he doesn't first equip them to do. And he's given us his Holy Spirit. And it goes a little bit into the Holy Spirit a bit later in this passage of Scripture. Okay, because the Holy Spirit is critical to our, to our capacity to be a witness for Jesus. Okay, because we need to reflect Christ. We can only do that as when the Holy Spirit can work in our life and come out of us. All right? And, but here it talks about the two things put off the old self and put on the new self. And created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Okay? So we ought not to continue living with the old values and standards that we had in our life, but we need to take on the values of God. I remember when I was a first became a Christian and I realised how ungodlike I was. In fact, I couldn't understand even that I could function in the capacity that the word was talking about. But what I reckon it just I was on a different wavelength. It just didn't comprehend to me. But I realised that, you know, I, re- I come to the conclusion is if what I think is this, and if the word says that, then I'm wrong. It doesn't matter how sincere I am, if, if, if it is contrary to what the Bible says, then it's wrong. And I have to, co- I have to come to that conclusion. And so therefore, my philosophy is that God is right and I'm wrong. And I need to change if it's not like what God is. Slowly, we're getting closer together. Okay? Before, it was miles apart, and now it's getting closer. Okay? So my, the way I think now is I think more like God. I think more like God, but the only way I can think more like God is if I read the Word of God. I, I, and I begin to understand what His expectations are of me. And I don't have to feel like I'm, it's totally ridiculous because the Holy Spirit's within me and within you to guide you step by step along the way. He won't put anything on us than we can cope with. The one thing I noticed when I first became a Christian, and that's a fair while ago, but the expectation of people was too great. I couldn't cope with it. Now, I would have people come to me and say, Simon, you shouldn't be doing this anymore. You shouldn't be doing like this. You shouldn't talk like this. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. And I thought, oh. And I realised that God's grace was far greater. And God's expectation of me was not like people's expectation of me. So I hope my prayer is that you don't judge others harshly. Because God enables us to grow at the length that he wants us. We are all a work in progress. Hallelujah. Every one of us hasn't, hasn't made it. But we're all getting there. Okay, we're all getting there. Okay, if we're sincere before the Lord and we allow him to do a work in our life, he will accomplish it. Okay, but, there is, but there's, a, there's, there's an effort on our part. It won't just happen. Okay, it won't just happen. Because you can be a Christian for 20 years and have grown one year. You can be a Christian one year and grow 10 years. I've seen it in different people. Because some people just grow because they are so open to what God wants that they are able to do. Are you growing? Are you growing at the rate you ought to be growing? That's the question that I ask. Only you know, and only God is able to do that. Okay, why should I alter my lifestyle because I'm a Christian? 
Why should I do that? I have to, each one of us needs to be able to determine that. Why should I change my lifestyle because of God? Why? Okay? The reason why is because we understand what Jesus has done for us and his love for us is so immense that I want to please him. And the only way I can please him is by obeying him to do and try to live the life he wants me to live. Okay? That's why. I just want to make it clear because some people believe now I'm a Christian, I live under a new set of rules. There's no life in a set of rules. Okay? If, if, if I'm trying to live up to uh, some sort of standard by disciplining myself, it won't work. It has to be because I want to please the person I love. I love God and I want to please Him. Yes. That's, that is the motive. Okay? Not that I have to live up to some sort of expectation. Okay? The Holy Spirit will enable me. Sure, I have the guidelines of how I should conduct my life, but I need the power to be able to do that. And that power comes from the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said, Behold, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power is required. The power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it's not a set of rules. Um, I wrote it down here somewhere. It's not punishment. Now I can't do what I want to do. Okay? It's not like that. It's not a set of rules. It's not punishment. It's life. It ought to be life. It ought to be what pleases us. And we need, but there needs to be a transformation. We ought not to be the same as we were in the beginning. So what do we have to do? Put off the old self and put on the new self. And that is by grace. We are being transformed. And also we need to start thinking differently. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 it says that we, we, we must have, be renewed. Our mind needs to be renewed. renewed. We need to start thinking like God. Okay, we've got, to, we've got to take off the carnal thinking and okay, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's good and pleasing will is for your life. Okay, it's when our life, when our mind is transformed. Okay, because it's what's up here determines how you will live. Your mind, I believe, is the most powerful assets that you have. And therefore, it needs to be in line with God. Okay? I'll just... In verse 25, it says, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbour, for we are all members of one body. Okay? So if you lie easily you have a problem because that needs to be transformed to, to, to being truthful, to be honest, okay? I remember a guy, I used to work, I used to build swimming pools and um, I had this guy that I was working for who was a chronic liar. This guy lied so much that he believed his own lies and therefore he always had a different story his truth was not truth anymore because he was, he was so consumed with lying that he, that he didn't even know the truth himself anymore. You know what? If you never tell a lie and you always tell the truth, you never have to worry about giving the wrong story. Is that right? Because if you, if you, if you tell the truth all the time, you'll always be okay. This guy... You didn't know where you're at because he used to change the story. No, no, truthfulness. We need to be truthful. It says, 
In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you were still angry and do not give, do not give the devil a foothold. Anger. Anger can be our response to disappointment. The best solution here is don't get angry. But if you do get angry, see, even Jesus got angry a couple of times. I mean, he was angry, went into the temple, and they were using the temple courts as a marketplace. And he went in there and threw the uh, stalls open. So that's a righteous anger. But the Bible says you don't let your sun go down on your anger. Generally speaking, if you're angry, you're angry usually with somebody. Okay? Here the instruction in the word is don't let the sun go down on your anger. Okay? Make sure you, you appease your circumstance before you go to bed. The instruction is in the word for a reason. Because to try and pick up the pieces later, particularly much later, it is an enormous task. If you have grossly offended somebody because of your outrage and anger, it's not going to fix up quickly unless it's stamped in the bud straight away. And that's why the word says, don't let the sun go down in your anger. Okay, Deal with it when it's fresh. Also, also I have a philosophy, is don't deal with issues while you're angry. If you're a parent... Don't discipline your children while you're angry. Because you'll regret. Always make sure that you have calmed down, you have appeased, you have thought for it clearly, and then you deal with the issue. Whether it's with a child or whether it's circumstance. So therefore, if you're an employer and you get angry with your employees, don't do anything until you have cooled down. You've had a chance to rule, reason it through and then you deal with the situation. Anger can destroy relationships. I want to talk a little bit later about resentment. But anyway, enough to say about anger. Okay? So, because it says, don't let your son go down here. So obviously it's okay to get angry sometimes. God knows that sometimes we will. Hopefully, we handle it properly as we go on in life. But make sure you don't let the sun go down your anger. Get it right, sort it out before you go to bed. Then you don't have to worry about it in the morning. You can think, well, I've still got to deal with some things, but at least I have broken the ice. Hallelujah. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yes. So that, that's why this passage of Scripture doesn't need a lot of explanation. But some things do need a little bit of explanation. But so therefore, I just want to encourage you. Okay? Why do I know anything about this? Because I've handled some things the wrong way. Okay? It's best to learn from other people's mistakes, not your own. But it's somehow we are sort of people that it doesn't work that way. We hear about it, oh, that was great, but then we do it. Need to learn it ourselves. Okay. Get rid of all bitterness. I'm in the wrong place here. It says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands and that they may have something to share with those in need. Okay? I told you once before that I, had a, I used to I used to have a ministry in prisons. And it, I was reminded just recently that uh, a lot of people in prison are in prison for something I've done wrong. And the mentality of some, some of them is in the area of stealing. They reckon, well, if I can steal something worth a lot of money, well, I should, why should I work for a little bit of money? Well, the reason is because uh, you may finish up in the wrong place and then you'll pay for it anyway. But you've got to be honest. The word tells us here we've got to be honest. Don't steal, okay? But if you do steal, okay? How does it say it again? 
Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. I... It must be here for someone, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Hallelujah. We should all be able to share with someone in need. So we all should be workers. Hallelujah. We're all workers here, aren't you? Hallelujah. No, no thieves among us. No one's going to admit it anyway. So, uh... Here we go for time. Spoke a little bit about, about anger. Now, <clears throat> the fourth section. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it will benefit to those who listen. Okay? We ought not to have a foul mouth as a Christian. We should only be a people who bless people with the words we speak. Hallelujah. Treat others as you would have them treat you. It's a good philosophy. You want to be encouraged? You've got to encourage. What you sow is what you reap. Okay? Be careful with the words that we speak. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God whom... whom with whom you were sealed on the day of redemp- for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God in us. He's our guide. He's the spirit of truth. He, 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 he shows us what's right and what's wrong. He guides us. He's our comforter. He's our representative. He's 100% for us. The Holy Spirit is 100% for you. He's there with you. You have a resource at your disposal, which is God himself with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now the Bible says here that we ought not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Holy Spirit is a person and the Holy Spirit must be able to be grieved. How can we grieve the Holy Spirit? I'll tell you, the main way we can grieve the Holy Spirit is by ignoring him. Now, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that we have the Holy Spirit. When you receive Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. You you can't receive Christ without the Holy Spirit because he comes as part of the deal. Okay, God becomes our Father. Jesus is our Saviour and Lord And the Holy Spirit is our... I call him my senior advisor. I don't make any decisions. I don't want to lie. I try not to make any decisions without running it past the Holy Spirit first. All right, there's some times that I've messed that up. But I want to allow him to guide my life. And it's only because of the reality that, 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 that I work on that that I have any hope of being transformed. God wants us to be transformed. God doesn't want us to remain the same. Okay? You can't remain the same. But you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can ignore him. It'll grieve him. But you, if, you are dis- if you disobey him, when you ask him, what do you want, how do you want me to handle this? And you say, well, blow that, I'm not going to do that. If you disobey the Holy Spirit, you will grieve the Holy Spirit. So, you, so we can grieve God. He doesn't want us to be, he doesn't want us to grieve him. Okay? We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve him. Ignore him. Disobey him. Blatantly disregard him. You know, some people say, well, it's my conscience that I... Well, the conscience is the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit, as a Christian, you've received the Holy Spirit, you need to go by his guidance. 
when he shows you something, you need to function in that way. I believe the Lord made a covenant with us many years ago. God is a covenant-making God. Okay, covenant, so God makes... When I first, when, when I, when I first come across, I thought that I made a deal with God or that we made a deal with God. And later on I realised that it was not a deal that was made with God, it was a covenant that God made with us. And so part of us, that we have the same DNA, is that we come under the same covenant that he made with us. The covenant is the agreement that we made right in the beginning because when the Lord asks us to do what he asks us to do, we say we can't do that, full stop. Incapable of doing what you've asked us to do as a work. And so therefore, as I said, I thought I made a deal. I didn't make a deal. It was God making a covenant. In her. And he said, the thing is, we must obey what he says. So if we want to be successful in life, if we want to fulfil our purpose, we must obey him when he speaks to us. And he only speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. He may use the word, he may use a person, but, but he, when he's speaking that, when there's a conviction that he speaks to us, our obligation is to obey him yes. and to remain faithful. Okay, so, so the covenant that he made with us right in the beginning is that we must obey what he says, no matter what it is, even if it doesn't make any sense. Because okay, sometimes God asks us to do things which don't make a lot of logical sense. But he's always right. Okay, he's always right. We must obey him and then remain faithful. Okay? I believe that's a covenant that he made with us in the beginning and therefore it's, that covenant remains through the work. I, I often share this with people, but I believe it's a, I believe it's a covenant. See, God's a covenant-keeping God. He never breaks his covenant. Okay, success and failure doesn't belong to us whether we're successful or unsuccessful, is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to remain faithful and our responsibility is to obey when he speaks to us. Okay? So I want you to get a hold of that. that I believe, that's a, that, I believe that, that's a word he specifically gave to us as a work. Right from the beginning. Okay? And if you don't do that, you will grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay, if you don't obey the Holy Spirit when he speaks to you. See, I have people come to me and say, Simon, it's all right for you, but God never speaks to me. Well, he always speaks to you, but you're not listening all the time. See, you need to learn, how, how, you need to, learn to hear from God in the little things. It's because some people believe that God only talks about big, important things. That's not true. He talks, he actually, I believe, he tests us. This is for somebody here. He actually tests us because uh, there's a prompting. Sometimes we have a prompting, just go and do this. And you think, oh, that's nothing. It could be as simple as pick up that bit of rubbish that's on the ground. Have you ever thought, been walking somewhere and you had a prompting, there, and it's, you didn't put the rubbish there, but it's there. And you think, oh, blow it, I'm not, not going to pick it up. Okay, because that was God speaking to you to see if you are able to listen to him. And you've ignored him or blatantly disregarded what he said. Now, you didn't mean it that way, but you see, if you don't, if you don't listen to God in the little things, he won't talk to you about things that are much bigger. Does that make any sense? Yes. We've got to be prepared to do the little things. Go and encourage somebody. Go and relieve this person from a duty. He doesn't only talk to me about this. He talks to you. Don't look at me so blank. <laughs> Obedience is the key to hearing from God. If you obey him, he will continue speaking and you will un you'll know he's speaking. When you disobey him, after a while you don't hear nothing. The Holy Spirit's speaking to us all the time. Okay? 
He's speaking into our life. He often tells us how to treat people. And it's always positive. He will never tell you to do something as negative or that would put somebody down. Now, I've only got a couple of minutes left, but, I have, but this major part that I want to talk about tonight, today, it says, I'll just read, read the rest of it. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave me. When I was going for my walk this morning, I believe the Lord showed me, he says, this is a major issue that we need, to, not for everyone, but there'll be somebody here in this category, is resentment. If you have resentment for, against anybody, you need to deal with it. It's a part of that last phrase that, that was there. Get rid of all bitterness, get all this sort of stuff. But it says resentment. The Lord really spoke about resentment. Don't allow resentment in your life. If you have an issue with somebody, clear it up. This is really important. You, you, you will have an inability to hear from God if you, if you harbour resentment. It will destroy your life. It will make you bitter. It will make you dissatisfied. It will make you look outside of yourself all the time or looking into yourself to say, poor me. We need to... Resentment is, is, is an absolute curse of the devil. It needs to have no part of us. You, you may say to you, well, that's all right for you to say. You know, you haven't got any major grievances. But if you knew what this person did to me, then you would realise that I have a right to resent this person. I want to say, you have no right to resent that person. You, the only th right you've got is to forgive that person. If you want forgiveness, you have to forgive. If you have resent resentment, you are holding onto a grudge, onto a grievance, and you are not forgiving. I believe you will, if, if, if you're in this category, and you, and you may be in your mind, you, that, that, what I've got a picture of, that this person is 100% in their mind, believe they're justified in, in, in this area of unforgiveness and resentment because of what happened to them. And I might agree with you to say that a horrible thing has happened to you, but I will say that you have to change your way and you have to get rid of that grievance, you have to forgive, so that you can be set free. Whenever we, whenever we obey God, God's blessing becomes upon us. You are holding back the blessings of God if you are holding any form of grievance or resentment or unforgiveness from another person. You are withholding God's blessing on your own life. The Bible is a word of blessing for us. If we adhere to the best of our ability to what God tells us, we will always be blessed. Even if he tells you to go and do some work, you will be blessed. But if you need to deal with an attitude, you need to deal with it because you are bound by the devil. The enemy has got hold of you exactly where he wants you. You need to sit, let go and let God. Okay? Even if you think it's so terrible, you need to forgive so you can be set free. As soon as, you, as soon as you harbour unforgiveness, you are trapped and bound by the devil. And the only way that you're going to be set free is to you let it go. And then you, you purposely, even though you believe in your heart, that person doesn't agree, doesn't deserve to be, to be uh, forgiven. Well, I want to say to you that there's not one person in this room that deserves to be forgiven because we've been saved by grace. What's the worst thing you've ever done? Maybe you haven't even done anything as bad as what happened to you. But the only solution is you need to be set free and you need to receive the blessings of God and it'll only happen if you forgive. 
I know it's there for someone. It, it, was, it, 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 it come on me too strong for me not to share it this morning. So someone here needs to be set free. You will be set free. You need to come to terms and say, okay, Lord, I forgive that person. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to hand it over. In yourself, you say, I can't forgive. You say, okay, well, before God, you can forgive. You say, oh, Lord, I want to hand it over to you, Lord, because you are awesome. You are the saviour. You are the Lord, and I want to obey you, and I'm going to hand it over to you. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. If you are carrying this with you, you need to release it over to the Lord and ask him for wisdom in the best way to handle it. I'm not going to tell you what the best way to handle it. The best way to handle it is to put it into his hands and say, Lord, I, I place it there right now. I forgive. I'll make a decision to forgive. How it outworks, I'm laying it at your hands and I want you to show me the correct way through. Okay? He knows the best, and you will be set free, because at the moment you are bound, and you are unable to do much of what God wants you to do, because your focus was 100% on the negative. God wants to release that off you, so that he can pour out his blessing on you. Hallelujah. We're all growing in Christ. Amen? All, at least at the level of what we are. We grow a year every year. Okay? We want to grow more than a year in one year. I'm not talking about natural growth. I'm talking about spiritual growth. I'm talking about relationship growth. I'm talking about the capacity to be a witness for those and to be able to use the gift that God's given to us to bless someone else because your gift is always there to bless someone else. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for the people that you've blessed us with here right now. Each one. Father, I pray a blessing upon each one right now. Where they are right now, Lord God, release them. Lord, I pray, Father, for victory. Lord, that we can be victorious Christians, Lord God, because we focus upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, the King of heaven and earth, Lord, is our boss. We work for you, Lord God. No matter what we're doing, Lord God, we acknowledge that it's for you. My, my attitude towards someone else is for you. I want to bless people. I want to be encouragement to people. And so, Father, I pray for blessing and encouragement amongst us, Lord God, because we want to be fulfilling our portion of the covenant. And that is to obey you and to remain faithful. Father, I pray your hand be upon each one right now. Guide and direct us. Bless each one. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn around to someone and say, you are a bit of all right. I'm not you two, you can't because you're... Can I just share something? Yeah. Yeah. Can I just... you, you, you may need this. Can I just share something on what Simon said? Um, a few years ago, I was really going through a very hard time of trying to forgive, um, really struggling with this whole thing. And I knew I should, and I just could not do it. And then um, I read a book, and God spoke to me so clearly through it, and he showed me three things, and it just revolutionised my life. And so. If it's for someone, I hope it's a blessing. If not, it doesn't matter. That's all good. Um, the first thing was, God showed me, I had to realise I was a sinner just the same as that person was a sinner. I was no different. I was a sinner, they were a sinner. I was going to hell, whether they were going to hell or not, who knows, but we were both sinners. The other thing was that I needed God to help me forgive. The same as I needed forgiveness, I needed God to help me forgive. And so I had to really ask God, like Simon said, to help me to do that. The third thing was that God showed me was that I get to choose how I move on from this. And, you know, that was the thing that really spoke to me um, the most, I think, because it gave me a way forward that it didn't mean that I had to go back into that situation or it didn't mean that I had to accept what was being done, but it meant that I could make a decision to say, show me, Lord, how now I move forward. And I can honestly say in this 
um, relationship, we have now, I have moved on with um, this person. Um, in a, in a, I love them. <laughs> it's bizarre. And we have a really good relationship. And, but I needed to set boundaries. Um, and, and I think that was the greatest thing for me that God showed me was that I'm a sinner the same as they, I make mistakes. I need the forgive, forgiveness of God like they do. I needed to know that. But the third thing was I get to choose with God, show me, Lord, how to move on with this. And that is so freeing. I just found that so freeing that I didn't have to remain in or under that situation. I had to do what I had to do. But God was able then to show me how to move on. And that just was so revolutionary for me. I hope it's for someone. You can do what I ask you to do. Go up to someone and say, you're a bit of all right. You're a bit of all right. It's up for you, Simon. <laughs> If anyone would like to see me, feel free. Yeah. We're always open.